remember what I was saying is that, you know, one of the primary objections of the critics, the skeptics saying, oh, no, you know, the, the, the was not an impact. It was a long, protracted uh, extermination mm, of the dinosaurs, right. et cetera, et cetera. And if you can't produce a crater, you know, you got for us to, to start buying into this theory, you have to produce the smoking gun, which is the crater, right? Well, then the crater got produced. They found the crater. And, in fact, several other craters, smaller ones, that seem to be date right to the same age. In fact, Indian geologists have found what they think is the Shiva crater, which is the same age, off the coast of India and in the Indian Ocean, right? So I haven't seen the latest studies to see if that's been verified or not, but the studies I've seen suggest that the Indian geologists really do believe that there's a giant KT boundary crater on the bottom of the Indian Ocean, which means it might have been a double whammy. Now, it might have not happened at the same time, but over a short period of interval, short interval. And one of the scenarios that's kind of emerging now from studies of the cosmic environment is that there may be periods that you might think of as a bombardment epoch, where you have longer periods where bombardments are relatively isolated and few, and then there will be a clustering. See, So a lot of the uh, critics of the dinosaur extermination said, well, they didn't all go extinct at once, so therefore it couldn't have been an impact. Well, what they're doing is they're imagining only a very almost obsolete model of impacts is that they only happen in isolation randomly one at a time. They weren't even conceiving of the fact that you may have periods of time where you have multiple impacts occurring over a short period of time Mm -hmm. or even multiple impacts occurring all at once. Like Shoemaker Levy 9, Right. in terms, we could think of that as, I mean, all of those impacts, 21 impacts, took place in less than a week. So that you could think of as, in a geological sense, that's simultaneous, right? Right. So now the question is, and, and you get some of the same objections with the, uh, the Younger Dryas boundary impact, is that, well, where's the smoking gun? Where's the crater? So, but here's the problem, as I see it. If you've got an impact into an ocean, well, chances are the crater is going to be very difficult to find, right? And if it's a two-mile deep ocean and a one-kilometer diameter impactor, the crater, what's called the transient crater, is only going to be a very short-lived. It's going to be in the water. Mm-hmm. Now it's going to create huge tsunamis, right? So now those tsunamis may leave deposits that could then be identified and dated, particularly if there's you know, datable material in there. If it's happened within the last 50,000 years, there's probably organic material that can be radiocarbon dated, right? But so that would be one thing you could look for to try to identify oceanic impacts. Now, you go back to the Ice Age, there's approximately six to seven million additional square miles of the Earth's surface that is covered by massive ice sheets. Most of that is in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, if you have a bombardment in the Northern Hemisphere at this time, the chances are much higher that that impact could have been into an ice sheet. Ice. Yeah. And was it basically all of Canada was covered in ice? All of Canada was covered in ice and a lot of the northern United States. And the the accepted scientific theory is that this was a gradualistic climate change. Yes. But that doesn't hold hold up anymore. I mean, in the old days, you could go back a few generations ago, coming, say, out of World War II, the belief was still that it was tens of thousands of years. Then radiocarbon dating came along. The problem with radiocarbon dating is, is the, the time span of deglaciation got contracted immensely. In other words, instead of being 50,000 years, now it was 10,000 years. Because Here's the thing. If it was a, if it was 50,000 years or 100,000 years that you had this slow accumulation of ice over, say, North America, more than half of North America, and then this slow disappearance, right? Well, if it came on, let's say, 75 to 100,000 years ago, the process began, well, where the ice is or was, you're not going to have forests, are you? Right. Forests aren't going to be growing where you've got thousands of feet of ice, right? Well, now that we can go in and we can take core samples of, you know, where the ice was, what do you think they're finding? They're finding remains of forests that are like 30 and 40,000 years old. 
So what does wow. that mean? Well, it means that you have to bring those glaciers on a whole lot quicker and get rid of them a whole lot quicker than anybody had previously been imagining. Yeah, didn't you say something like there was woolly mammoths that were flash frozen like in an instant? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you say an instant, but, you know, within a few a hours. Few hours, right. hours, yeah. The most famous being the Barasovka mammoth of, uh, I think, was found in 1901. And that's the most famous one that pretty much everybody, there's been a lot of flash frozen mummified remains of Pleistocene uh, mammals that have been found. But this is one of the most famous. Um, and I still don't know the full, I don't know the explanation for this, um, other than the fact that it had to have been a catastrophic event. But the, the woolly mammoth was found about, I think it was six tons, right, body mass, uh, found in a frozen, in the permafrost on a riverbank, right? And with the degla- with the warming of the climate that began in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the riverbank collapsed and exposed this guy who had been sitting frozen in, in, the, in the, uh, the matrix, this matrix of frozen permafrost, right? Mm-hmm. They were able to, in that first year, uh, no, there was no scientific studies. I think it was a year to two years later when the, the first scientific studies took place. Anyways, they get there, and in the interim, the skull had been exposed, and wolves apparently had eaten the flesh off of the, mm. the skull. But the flesh of the remainder of the mammoth was still intact. And um, it was sitting on its haunches, and in its mouth was a mass of vegetation that it had been eating that it didn't even have time to swallow. And in its stomach, there was about 27 different types, species of hedges and um, plants and things, including flowering plants. Now, a mammoth is a grazer, which means that it it grazes on the ground as opposed, like, say, to a mastodon, which is a browser. It likes to eat tree branches and tree leaves and things like that. Mm-hmm. But so by an analysis of the stomach contents, which was not putrefied, they were able to identify many of these different kinds of plants, flowering plants even, that this, this poor guy was munching on, right? And uh, he's sitting on his haunches, and both of his, uh, his pelvic bones are broken, like we suggesting that he was thrown back very violently, um, an erect penis. Now, what that means is that uh, was caused by suffocation. Really? Right? Yes, that's right. That's one of the things that, and it because the suffocation, the pressure of the enclosing matrix of material, I guess, forces the blood out to the extremities. <laughs> So that's wild. Isn't that wild? <laughs> that is fucking wild. I did not know that. No, a lot of people don't know that. Really mammoths with boners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you start putting Being all that together. Frozen. <laughs> yeah. Think about this. The guy, poor guy is standing there munching. It's probably fall based upon the, 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 the seeds and the pollens and the, the status of the, mm-hmm. the flowering plants. It was probably fall. A fairly, you know, benign day. The the guy is standing there munching, is having his lunch or whatever, and then all of a sudden, boom, a shock wave throws him back on his haunches so violently that his pelvic bones are broken. He's immediately covered in a mass of material, um, and then that mass of material is completely frozen so quickly and so cold that the entire carcass basically has to be frozen through and through within 10 hours, or the contents of the stomach would become putrefied which it wasn't right so the entire carcass is frozen the six ton mammoth how do you explain that and the answer is i don't know right i really don't know other than the fact that one possibility to me is that if you have an object rapidly you know moving at say you know 20 miles 15 to 20 miles per second given that the atmosphere is only about eight miles thick if you've got an object that's coming in and moving, you know, at, at 15 miles per second, it's only going to take half a second to penetrate the entire atmosphere. So it may actually blow out a hole and bring in, um, you know, gases that are close to, to absolute zero. Oh, my God. And that could be one explanation. But 
I don't know the explanation. It, it, it needs to be, it, it's one of those conundrums of geology that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, the old days, they'd say, oh, well, he fell in a crevice and then got buried. And the problem with that is, is that we can see modern examples of, like, caribou falling into crevices or modern elephants, um, you know, dying around water holes and things. Mm-hmm. And carcasses are not preserved. You know, you have to have unusual conditions to preserve, particularly of a, of a mega mammal, which is defined as any mammal over 100 pounds in body weight, roughly. Right. Um, you know, during the, some of those horrible droughts in sub-Saharan Africa in the 80s, you had massive elephant mortality around car, uh, water holes. Typically, you got an elephant that dies there. Its carcass decays. Uh, scavengers will eat the flesh and carry off bones and stuff. Typically, within five years, there was no evidence that you'd had a, a five-ton elephant laying there, carcass laying there next to the water hole. So typically, for any animal to become a, a, a part of the, the fossil record, they have to be removed rapidly from the um, uh, forces that would normally recycle the remains. I mean, think about this. You know, during the... Uh, Post-Civil War, 1870s, 1880s, and there there was a tremendous slaughter of American bisons. And you had thousands of bison carcasses just left to rot on the prairie. They're gone. They were gone within a decade or two. There was no remnant of them there. In order for those carcasses to be preserved as fossils, they have to be removed from oxygen. They have to be removed from scavengers. They have to typically be buried very rapidly, very quickly. Yes.